Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to introduce you to Maria Gritsevich, who is a good friend of mine and is a strong collaborator of our Botes uh, Research Group now here in Granada. And she's also collaborating with the University of, of Malaga. Another reason why she's also here visiting us these days. Uh, Maria Gritsevich is a prominent scientist known for her expertise in planetary science with a special uh, focus on meteoritics and planetary defense. In 2017, Maria earned a um, title of docent at the University of Helsinki, which is uh, equivalent to a just adjunct professor. And her academic journey started when she studied uh, mechanics and mathematics at uh, Moscow University. And then she got a, a degree in uh, physics and mathematics at the famous Lomonosov State University in year 2009. Uh, Dr. Grisevich's contributions to science have been substantial, encompassing a deep understanding of meteor phenomena and physical properties of meteorites, along with the potential hazards. Her research to be presented today in his seminar includes modeling of the dynamic of meteorite entry into the Earth's atmosphere, evaluation of outcomes associated with asteroid and meteorite impact, and practical know-how of meteorite recovery. She has indeed helped to recovery in several places, as she will tell us. And uh, something also I should uh, strengthen is that she has authored about 100 papers in leading peer review journals, uh, contributed to over 200 extended conference abstracts and proceedings paper, and authored five book chapters. And in tandem with her robust publication record, she actively participates in editorial work, having conducted over 120 reviews for journal publications or project proposals, where she's also heavily involved. Indeed, she spends part time of uh, handling editor uh, duties, for example, as uh, in the journal Meteoritics and Planetary Science, and having overseen more than 100 editorial contributors today. Um, I think that for us, it's really a, a honor to have you here, Maria. And uh, I mean, you are a, a person well known in the, in the field, uh, I know, and you have also collaborated with Olga at some point here. So uh, we're looking forward to, to hear you and to keep the collaboration with you for the GSTP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This blinking is okay. I the video is on the mic computer, so mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I will start my talk. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. So let's hit, hit with interactive if you want. So any questions are welcome at any time. Um, so why, why are we interested in this subject? We have a lot of fireball networks worldwide, a lot of uh, meteor registration, a lot of uh, meteorite falls. So roughly I would estimate that we get like 1 million meteors registered every year cumulatively by different fireball networks worldwide, including Butis, including University of Malaga, in Barcelona, where is Spanish meteor network. And if you go to meteorite, uh, if, if you go to museum, worldwide, for example, in Vienna, where is a very, very nice museum and very nice meteorite collection. And you would also see that we have a lot of meteorite samples. Uh, so many meteorite samples, and I would roughly say 100,000. I think it's over 70,000 officially registered and ma many not registered. But if you want a meteorite with a um, known history, so known trajectory, known orbit in the solar system, when we, when we only have about 50 cases which belong to both categories. So it's it's only about 50 cases that we have both trajectory registration and meteorite recovery, which I think is uh, could be drastically improved by just applying some 
uh, modern methods of processing. I will distribute here Chilernik samples so you could look how meteorites meteorites look like while I talk. Um, okay. I think many of you have seen, but you you, you could have a look on this two Chilernik meteorite samples. This is the famous one that. Uh, <laughs> well, in Russia, in uh, yes, 2013, 15 of February. <laughs> So the idea is basically to match this community. So there is a big data set of fireball registrations, big data, data set of meteorite recovered, but they almost don't cross. And um, this is the case of Odelan recovered in Sweden uh, in, two, in, in 2020. So this is our um, paper reference. You could read more about this case. And this is actually a very interesting case because, first of all, it was registered by our network in Finland, Finnish Fireball Network, when it was also first iron meteorite which got instrumentally registered. And now I will show you in the next slide how how it was how it was going in the atmosphere. Yes, you could see. It was actually really, really low. It's also the lowest ever um, penetrated fireball because it went to 11.28 28 kilometers. And in the talk, I will I will first now talk about introduction, why I think it's important, <laughs> when about method implemented for to, to, to identify parameters, when why I think it works or why we think it works. <laughs> And then once we track the method, how to apply it more generally for the, for the larger events. So a meteoroid is anything uh, moving in interplanetary space and size is larger than an atom, smaller than asteroid. When this meteoroid comes to the atmosphere, it, it starts to interact with air, produces a visible path, which we call a meteor. And most meteors in Earth's atmosphere is are visible in the altitude range of 70 to 100 kilometers. We are now just about to publish a paper about meteors in Venusian atmosphere. It's also very, very interesting. It's actually we estimate that there will be more meteors on Venus than on Earth. So we could get much more observations there. And fireball or bolide is essentially the same phenomenon as a meteor, it's just simply brighter intensity. So it's something much, much bigger and larger. And finally, some of its events, very few, uh, will survive the atmospheric path and will land on the ground to be recovered as a meteorite. So a meteorite is something what is recovered on the ground. Uh, and this is very nice uh, illustration from our uh, German paper from Munera in 2021. So I could explain you here now in more details and you have a sample so you could look. Uh, can you see my mouth? Yes. Uh, we have a meteoroid coming from orbit, so it comes to the upper atmospheric layers, it experiences preheating to the point where it starts to produce luminosity. So the luminous trajectory starts, and in this, during this luminous phase, which we call meteor or fireball, we have uh, major processes like light emission, a mass loss, deceleration, it also has fusion crust formation. On the samples which I distributed, you could see the black fusion crust on top of the sample. So this is exactly what's happening here during this luminous phase. And um, it also experiences often fragmentation. So some larger fragments are formed, but also some meteoritic dust is lost, which in suspension could also land in the form of micrometeorite. A smaller event we call a meteor, when we have also interplanetary dust sometimes, which lands without producing a meteor phenomena. And this is when micrometeorite, which also can be recovered. And this is intensive work we are now doing in the University of Malaga, studying micrometeorites. Uh, at some point, the fireball will uh, vanish, disappear. This is happening because kinetic energy of the object is not enough anymore to produce luminosity. This could happen in two cases. Point number one is uh, mass simply is gone, so all mass got ablated, and even velocity was uh, maybe 
still considerably high. So there is nothing, there is no body anymore. So there is nothing to produce luminosity anymore. And case number two is more different, more, more interesting because this is when mass is still left, but velocity is too small. So the kinetic energy is too, too, too small to produce luminosity. And this is when what we call a dark light. So the fire, the, the meteorites would eventually land and form a strewn field. And this is also one of ongoing um, publications from, from us about strewn field. Strewn field is not actually an ellipse. It has much more elaborate shapes and thinking that strewn field can be approximated by a line as it, as it is often a field or an ellipse is um, not, not very accurate approximation. So this is where we also take into account winds and calculate where different masses with different shapes and uh, different densities would land using the winds for specific events. Uh, it's also maybe important to notice that uh, when luminosity ends, there, be, there will be still a small portion of trajectory when ablation is still continuous, so it's not instantly it's switched off, but very soon after the time of the There are many ways to detect fireballs, and I think there are more, but we could uh, maybe list with main. So first the telescopes, radars, there are now a few asteroids which were registered just before we hit the atmosphere. So sometimes for a large meteoroid, it's possible to register a little bit in advance. Uh, when we have uh, radars, I am collaborating with a group in Kiruna in Sweden. We have very powerful radar. So the peculiarity of radar is that the uh, observational volume is very limited. But when you get very, very detailed scan of every single particle with the sensitivity, which is impossible to, to get with optical devices, at least not at the today. Uh, when we also get sonic booms, we have infrasound uh, seismic registrations, especially in case of meteorite falls. And also in US, we were very successful using weather radars. This is when during the dark flight, after the fireball terminated, in weather radar you can see specific uh, peculiarities in the in, in, in the wind or in the weather data. So this is. Now what's going on with when the fireball networks and meteor detection. But if you look in the past, you would see that uh, impacts have shaped uh, significantly Earth and other planets and uh, moons in our solar system and probably beyond. Uh, so if you look in the past, this is what could eventually happen. So this is the largest verified impact crater on Earth in South Africa. It's called Redford. And it's uh, 300 kilometers in diameter. And when we have a uh, Barringer crater in Arizona, also very famous, was formed by uh, Iron Canyon Diablo meteorite. And it's about 1.2 to 1 .2 kilometers in diameter. So it's interesting because you could see it's a very uh, well-shaped structure impact of a solid object, which basically goes without notice through the atmosphere, it doesn't fragment, it just makes one big crater and meteorites. And this is similar to me, it appears similar lunar lake in India. It's 1.8 kilometers, so also same. One, one, one crater, very well formed, and a lot of meteorite fragments. When we have different group of events, like Sihotaelin, for example, a large, iron object comes to the atmosphere and it fragments, it produces a lot of meteorites and a lot of craters. So it's a little bit different. And this happened in Russia in 1947. A lot of stones, a lot of fragments were recovered. And when we also have cases like Tunguska, so a large object comes to the atmosphere, it um, loses mass so effectively that at the time of reaching the ground, there is no mass left, so no meteorites were recovered. But the shock wave reaches the ground and it destroys a huge patch of forest. So this is how Tunguska is looking still nowadays, like after 100 years after event, it happened in 1908. 
And you see, it it happened in remote uh, Siberia, but if it would happen three hours before, it would hit a city like Moscow, and it would totally destroy the whole megapolis. So it's 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 a big thing. And um, at the end of this presentation, you will understand why actually different uh, events, different powerful events, may produce with different seemingly different consequences. Another reason why we are interested, you. All of you know that uh, now space agencies are actively involved in 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 uh, so-called sample return missions. One of them can be Rosetta, and in case of Rosetta, a billion euro was spent just to send um, uh, a mission to Comet Churyumov Gerasimenko to maybe get a sample, analyze back in the lab. So of course we get spectacular images of the comets and our knowledge is significantly improved, but it costs a lot. Uh, in this case, this is very complementary to sample return missions. The only difference is but in sample return mission, you are planning in advance. It's usually 30 years planning and you are thinking, all right, which will be the target? Which sample do we want to bring back? And in this case, a lot of samples are choosing us. So the samples are choosing us. And it's up to us to just uh, observe it, calculate it, go to the field, pick it up, and bring it to the lab. And that's basically almost free. Because this is so interesting, uh, people organize so-called multi-station observations. And from multi-station observations, what usually is the, uh, the usual uh, like parameters which get calculated are meteor height. You get uh, uh, space uh, stations spaced, say, 200 kilometers away, ideally, or 100. And when by triangulating, you get meteor height, position. So you get the trajectory. You also get lengths along trajectory. And from this separate lenses, you calculate velocities. You get meteor intensity, how bright Virgo was, if you engage with, with uh, uh, light curves. You also get spectrum. So you could also get spectra if you use special equipment. And first uh, such a project was done in Harvard. It was called Harvard Meteor Project, and it was done by a famous astronomer, Fred Weibler. He started in 1936, ended in 1951. Uh, they collected a lot of orbits and there are some publications, but they didn't recover any meteorite. So the first successful meteorite recovery project was done in Andreev, and it was led by Zdenek Cetlaka. They started in 1951, and Bright Fireball was photographed on April 7, almost like today, <laughs> 1959. And following this registration, four meteorites were recovered near Pshibram in, in Czechoslovakia at this time. So this is, you could see the registration of this first fireball which led to meteorite recovery. And uh, these were the four pieces which got recovered. So one got broken after, after being picked up. And since when, as I explained to you, over uh, around 50 cases now with known orbits, one would expect we would have much more, but <laughs> this, is, this is the reality. It's now, now statistics is improving. I couldn't fit the whole list here, so it's uh, Matthias Mayer has very nice uh, web page here, which you could visit for all this. So now what we can do with the data. When we have uh, ground-based observations, so to give it, uh, to give you a simple touch how it looks like, with where the images I still work during my PhD, but these are good representative images. Usually what you get as input parameters to model really the event, to understand the event is fireball brightness. So how bright it was, intensity, height, and velocity. And you could see that, um, for example, in European fireball network, we use this um, rotating shutter on top. So the shutter would make these kind of breaks. And when you know the periodicity of the shutter, so from these breaks, you would estimate velocity at different points of time. And these are uh, shown cases here is meteorite Neuschwanstein, famous meteorite from Germany, which was recovered. And this is industry from Canada, uh, Canadian uh, meteorite, meteorite and recovery project. 
And now for interpreting fireball observations, there are a few methods. I will briefly touch uh, photometric and I will mostly explain them. So in phot photometric method, uh, it is rightfully assumed that part of kin changes in kinetic energy with uh, coefficient, uh, luminous coefficient tau is converted to luminosity. And this is good. And this study this, so it actually gives good results. But usually what is happening in, in the field is that most people say, well, velocity didn't change that much, so we actually could um, could uh, decide that velocity was constant, so deceleration was negligible. And then by substituting this condition here, you could get changes in mass instead of change of kinetic energy. And then you could, this is what you would call photometric mass. So when intensity is directly converted to photometric work, and sometimes it's good, but uh, oftentimes it's not so good, especially in case of uh, in case of meteorite falls, because when you really have to look also in changes in velocity. Mm -hmm. And we did we did the analytical study on this, and it it works. It's just a little bit um, more equation, so people don't like it. But this is published in Icarus in 2011, and it goes, gives good results. And also some follow up study studies are available now. And sometimes people also mix with two, like photometric and dynamic. I I personally prefer not to do it because when you have too many free parameters to fit, and you could do, as I will show you now, without completely not assuming anything. So the parameters will be combined in such a way that you don't need any assumptions and you would arrive to, to meaningful estimates. So in dynamical case, we have uh, this equations main which are considered in the first one is basically second law of Newton mass multiplied by deceleration is equal to the sum of the forces and the moment first force is drag force so we have here drag coefficient cd density of air velocity to the power of two and cross section area of the body cross section area of the body is something that the body is moving in long the trajectory and if you take a plane perpendicular to the trajectory this is your projection of your body, your big whole cross section. So when simple geometrical relationships, which is only used to get rid of time. So to so now we will pass on the next slide from time to, to height. And when slope of trajectory is here, and and the last one is describing how mass is changing with time. So we the effective destruction enthalpy is how much uh, is is showing the rate of uh, mass loss in, in in of a unit of mass and here we have similar relation to the first one except we have heat exchange coefficient here and we have velocity to the power of three so now with this second equation will be used to substitute time this height here and here and we will be left with two equations so we are left with two equations I rewrite them in this form. And then what is really important and powerful is uh, getting rid of dimensions. So we are getting rid of dimensions. I really try to minimize this, but uh, it, will, it will stop soon, don't worry. <laughs> we will get rid of dimensions. And um, so now instead of using mass, we will use normalized mass. We divide by initial uh, mass, pre-atmospheric mass value. So instead of dealing with mass changing from Me to zero, we are now dealing with M small changing from one to zero. So we normalize velocity with initial velocity value and we normalize height with height of the homogeneous atmosphere. This is constant for every planet. It basically means that if you take a planet and its atmosphere, and if you compress the atmosphere so that the density is constant everywhere, you get a constant for each line. So we need this one. When we scale a uh, cross-section area for body with initial cross-section area for body, and we scale the density of air with gas density at sea level. And then you could see that we have two equations and we have five variables five parameters. So if you want to find analytical solution, which is possible in this case, we need two more equations. 
And this is easy <laughs> because if you think about it, the way uh, cross-section area loses, uh, cross-section area changes and mass is changes, they correlate. So these two parameters are related and it was proposed already 50 years ago or even more uh, by Yuri Levin. So what there is parameter mu, which can be used. And this parameter mu is often called shape change coefficient. So why shape change coefficient? I will explain it easily. So if you have mu equal to zero here, any, any number in the power of zero equals to one, which means um, that your cross-section mass, mass is lost, but cross-section area is constant. When is it possible? This is possible when for your, your body is moving, or if your movement is oriented, and when cross-section area is can be approximated as a constant, but all mass is lost from the frontmost point. So you are kind of going like this, you are keeping the size in cross-section area, but with ab ablation goes from the frontmost part very effectively. And in the other case, limiting case, so the mu is equal to two thirds, and this is when shape of the body is constant. So the shape of the body is constant means that body would rap rapidly rotate and ablation would take uniformly in place in all directions, so that your shape will be constant. In most studies, people just say, oh, shape is constant, and this is, but it's so easy to have this mu, and in case of keeping the mu, what, what what happens is that it could be usually between zero and two thirds, and it can be, it can be anything. So I think it's it's it doesn't make any trouble to figure. And when you really allow for shape change during the during the trajectory, and what you could also do, you could recover this new from light curve analysis. What we done with with the other papers, which I will not cover here for the sake of time. Uh, and other two parameters which uh, correlate is density of air and height. So it's clear that when you go upper, the density becomes, the atmosphere becomes rarefied. So you could use this exponential atmosphere as a simple analytical approximation, but you could also use any arbitrary model and we have a separate paper about it uh, with ESCO. Uh, so you could go to this paper and read how to do it for any paper, for any atmospheric model, but I will just cover today exponential. And if you use now these two, these two equations, uh, you could solve, equa solve with um, differential equation, e equations I had analytically. And the beauty here is really we didn't have to assume anything. We didn't have to say, oh, drag coefficient is this, or heat exchange coefficient is this, or, you know, body loses masses like this. This is what usually happens. Really nothing. So this is this is the beauty of it. When we take first integrals, we need initial condition, and the initial condition used here is like this. The body comes from very far, infinite height, and it, in, in the beginning, it has initial velocity and initial mass, super easy. Once you introduce these two differential equations, you get with two equations. I think it's my last slide with equations, so. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, the first one describes how mass is changing with velocity. So this is how dimensionless mass is changing with dimensional velocity. And the second one is explaining how height is changing with dimensional velocity. So, and you see that here we have now three parameters, alpha, beta, and mu. Mu, I just explained, is a shape change coefficient. And the alpha, beta, I will explain for the, in the next slide, we emerged from this dimensionalization what we were doing. And also here, there is this um, special function called uh, Exponential integral. Some people are afraid of it, but it, it, it's it's really easy. It's just uh, something, some function you could find in any textbook. This is how it is defined. And there is also Taylor series, which is super easy to handle in calculations. So we have this uh, two analytical expressions now, how mass changes, how height changes. And I will explain what alpha and beta means so that you understand. So the alpha and beta emerge from uh, our dimensionalization, and they, they include many of the unknowns we don't know, like mass, 
drug coefficient cross section are informed. So if you would uh, take a time to think a little longer about it, you would understand what actually what happening is that instead of having eight parameters and assuming six of them to, um, to derive the other two, we, are, we have a combination of these parameters and now this combination can be der derived in unique way and we don't need to assume anything about it. And uh, if you look into the definition for alpha, so this is what, uh, we, we call it ballistic coefficient uh, alpha is composed of, you would see that, uh, so alpha is actually shows a ratio between the two masses. We have mass of the air here, or mass of the um, entry mass of, the, of your body here. And we have here mass of the air in front of the object because this is, you see this is density of air at the, sea level multiplied with height of the homogeneous atmosphere, then with cross-section area of the body. And when you divide it by the sinus of slope, so you, you really, it's literally shows you if body comes to the atmosphere, how much air it has to push through to reach the ground. And now you look how much is this air if you, if you divide it by the, air, by the initial mass of the body. So we don't look exactly what's the mass of the object, but we look what's kind of effective mass. So how much is the mass of, the, of what the body has to go through divided by the mass of the air? It's the ratio of masses and you will see how effective it is in characterizing uh, part of the event. So similarly, we have this mass loss parameter beta. Now, if you look into definition of this, this will be ratio of kinetic energies. So beta will show you how much is kinetic energy of the object at the entrance, at, at the entry to the atmosphere. If you divide to how much energy you would need to fully destroy this object in the atmosphere. So this is where your uh, material properties come to play. So if alpha is not sensitive, alpha is only sensitive to masses, what's the rate of mass? So here you would have a huge difference if your body if is made of iron, of stone, or of ice huge difference, you would see. And, and, and this is, this is, you will see later how this plays a role in understanding meteor phenomena, because if you just uh, say, okay, this is the object comes with this kinetic energy, it's not so representative as beta, because it really could be made of anything. And when uh, one ton of ice and one ton of iron would have very different Property, uh, very, very di different outcomes in the atmosphere. And now what can be done, uh, like to put it in a simple way, we have, when we have meteorite uh, fiber registrations, this is example of industry meteorite here. So the observation data can be, can be processed into a table, which has time, height, and velocity at different points along the trajectory. So on the one hand, we have how time, height, and velocity were changing in our observations. And on the other hand, we say, okay, if we trust this theory, then height should change with velocity according to this law. So the solution is super simple, just to compare this uh, equation, how height and velocity should be ch changing in theory with um, points from observations, for example, using least squares method. And then from this fit, you get just unique, just one alpha and beta uh, pair, which fits to every fireball event. So every fireball table like this could be fitted with alpha and beta, which provides the best fit for the solution. And this is what we will be seeing now, how this is used. Now we have also modified this method. So we have actually, uh, applied it to partial trajectory registration, and it also works because this is what you need for radar. Radar doesn't detect the beginning of the trajectory. And for other data, but we have super nice, very fine resolution. So we have very nice resolution of data, but it's part of trajectory. And we try to fit with method and it also works super nicely. So you could see that all data are very aligned. And even so we didn't catch the beginning, we can actually reconstruct it by using this method. Uh, so apart from what I have shown, uh, 
why do we, there are a few nice reasons, uh, which at least for me is pleasant to see why I think this is works. First is pre-atmospheric size estimate. We collaborate with few groups who analyze meteorites in the lab. One of them is in, uh, in, 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 in the University of Bern. So the Swiss uh, people, and when um, what we're doing is when meteorite is recovered, so we, we pick up a sample of meteorite, we take, make a thin section, we bring it in the lab, and in the lab we do cosmogenic radio lights. And from this cosmogenic radio lights, we are able to deduce the size of the object uh, it, which was before heating atmosphere. And so far, it's incredible because everything we did, it's, it's totally independent uh, estimate. So we do chemistry in the lab. Uh, I do trajectory interpretation in, in computer. And then what the masses what we get or the sizes what we get are pretty much same so far. So this is, was done for several cases now. For Kochitsa, we got uh, results which was almost scary to publish because the difference was like, I think it was like one, uh, 150, like 10, 10, 10 kilograms maybe different, so it was like less than one person difference. It, it's, 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 it's crazy. Then also we had with uh, Joseph Trigo Rodriguez, a student, uh, Manuel Moreno Ivanes, and we were doing uh, this um, terminal height calculations. So I had this idea that, um, we could also estimate the terminal height, which I like because uh, apart from terminal height, it would imply that you could actually estimate the duration of fireball, and nobody did it so far. So if you have if you have event which would come to the atmosphere using this method, you would be able to say at which point it would terminate, which I think is important because so far nobody was looking into this. And what we did with Manuel is that I I just gave him a bunch of uh, calculations of more fireballs, and I said, imagine you know nothing about those fireballs, so imagine you have no observational data, and I only tell you alpha and beta for each event, and tell me when they would terminate. So he, he computed with terminal height, just using this theory, and when we compared to real observed uh, terminal height from these events, and in all cases, we got super nice match, you can see uh, they're all aligned. So this is like computed and observed, which is incredible. Apart from, from the few cases here, which are actually meteorite droppers and which have very simple explanations because for calculating with terminal height, we assume that mass is zero, but mass was not zero here because something dropped. So these are meteorite producing events. And then of course we have now few meteorite cases recovered. So I will just show you one which was happening in Finland. So these methods are applied in Finland for the processing of the data of the Finnish fireball network. We have a network fully run by amateurs. It's an amazing job I do. And it was in 2014 that we got this registration of ANA. It was registered by several places, many, many uh, people who saw it by own eyes reported to Finnish popular web page. And this is one of the images we got from Finnish Fireball Network. And um, the second image, this is how Fireball was going. Uh, but images from Finland were not so uh, sufficient. So we looked online and we were able to find a video in YouTube from Snežna Horts. And when we were able to reconstruct the trajectory here, we only we didn't get the end of the trajectory, but it was enough for us. So we got with three Finnish stations and one video from Snezhnogorsk. I will show you now this video. It was it's short. <laughs> Yes, so so this this was a video and it, it, it's really amazing that I, I think we found this video on YouTube. We were able to reconstruct which city it was, which street it was, where car started, what was the speed of the car, and then calibrate the camera and get it to the point that we could really get exact trajectory. So 
Jupiter was found on the sky for calibration when horizontal and vertical lines reconstructed. And do it to the point that we could actually estimate the trajectory and send people to the field to recover the meteorite. I think it's amazing. <laughs> so this is the uh, kind of popular article in our Finnish uh, popular astronomy magazine, Tiger Pia Avaros, and uh, it was published still before, before the meteorite was recovered. But it gives you a good illustration of the horrible pass. So this is the alpha beta fit. As you could see, this is the um, observational dot here. And the line you could imagine, you could imagine that this is the fit to the dots, but this is not the fit to the dots. This is analytical solution, which I was showing before with alpha and beta. It just provides such a good fit. It just provides such a good fit. So these are the results of calculations, the ballistic coefficient and masses parameters, beta masses, terminal mass and initial mass. And you could see that if, if I would compare at this time to the available meteorites, which were much less than now. It would be very similar to Ines, extremely in, is similar. Like uh, So it was clear for us that we should do very detailed dark flight uh, calculations and try to go to the field and recover. And this is what we did. So where was this uh, dark flight um, calculation made? Many, many, many fragments were uh, forecast with different masses. And then I have here a zoom up of, of this area. So you could see in this zoom up, these are two fragments which were recovered, 120 grams and 40 grams. And these are predicted masses. So they are very close in, in very proximity of this area. So with this strong field, we sent, uh, I was in contact with uh, my friends in Ural. Federal University because we already collaborated in Chelyabinsk a year, year ago. They trusted and they said, yes, we will go. <laughs> we will go. And then there was also Thomas Kohout from University of Helsinki who joined the expedition. So four people. They came to only for three days and the first day they didn't find anything. They just arrived to place and so on. And next day, Nikolai Kruglikov, who is here on the photo, he saw the meteorite from the car. I think it's amazing. He saw the the, the meteorite from the car, it was just on, on the ground. Somehow he just managed to spot it. Uh, it was recovered very soon. So the fireball happened in uh, April, and this was recovered in May, and it has zero weathering grade. Okay. And then uh, next day, they just follow the same area, and they, in the morning, they found the second sample, and then they just had to go home because uh, they only booked for three days. Okay. We did immediately all analysis of the samples. Uh, this is published now. Also, orbit could be calculated with our Meteor Toolkit software. So this is where the meeting point <laughs> with the Earth. Yes. So if you think you can trust it, you could apply it to much larger data sets. And we did put to, to many now. Uh, free pawn, uh, different fireball network in Australia, you know, Finnish, Spanish. So there are a few publications now about this methodology, but I will just explain you how it works and you will see how how easy and beautiful it is, I think. So you have, uh, what I have here on this plot is a logarithmic representation of alpha and beta for different fireball cases. And here I show you example of Canadian MORP meteorite observation and recovery project okay, uh, fireballs. So I have here logarithmic scale, so logarithm alpha and logarithm beta. And then for each fireball event published by, uh, by this program, I calculate alpha and beta and put it on the plot. So I take next event, put it on the plot and just calculate all. And suddenly what I discovered when is that uh, there is only one meteorite that we uh, recovered. And for this, this meteorite is the leftmost point on this plot. And this was interesting. So it actually means that it's not the meteorite with the biggest mass, but it's the meteorite with the smallest ballistic coefficient. So it was a meteorite 
it was it, it was a fireball with uh, most optimal ratio between the masses, so mass of the air divided by the mass. This was most optimal, very favorable for meteorite recovery, and this is why it was recovered. And um, if you think more about it, it is actually possible to construct the curves which would separate meteorite production from fireballs which would fully ablate. And then for these curves, you need some kind of analytical definition what is meteorite. And depending on this definition, it may change. So here I have, I, I, I tell to, to machine, I call meteorite anything which is at least eight kilos. And this is the curve that could be built. It's also slope sensitive. So, but anyway, the idea is that for um, now you could actually, for each fireball event, you could calculate alpha and beta and plot this curve. So it's, it's just jumping, I didn't touch it. You could plot, uh, you could calculate alpha and beta, you could plot this curve and based on, on your graph, graphical representation or analytic or whatever you prefer, you could decide is it producing meteorites or not. So this is super important or, and super fast and you could do more detailed follow-up later. But this is um, handy in this sense that now when we register so many fireball events every year, you could just run it automatically and decide which are interesting cases and which are not so interesting. And now coming back to the events which I was showing you in the introduction. So you remember I was showing you with Barringer Crater, Canyon, Dublin, Meteorite, Tunguska, Sivotelling. We could see how this would look on the plot. And on this alpha beta plot, they would appear like this. So uh, uh, Barringer Crater is somewhere down. So it had very low mass loss and very low ballistic coefficient too, so huge mass. And mass was not lost practically so much. Then for uh, Cihotelli, well, it's a little bit less mass and also, or at least a higher ballistic coefficient. And it was also losing mass a little bit higher. So it was fragmenting. And then Tunguska is somewhere up. I wanted to, to specify that this is logarithmic scale. So my origin, corresponds to the point where both parameters are one. And this is the area where just uh, parameters are very small, but positive, very positive. And now what, in, in this plot, I could, I could draw the two lines. So one line would show the area where meteorites are produced. So this is meteorite producing curve. And the other line is another paper, which was also published is pr uh, production of craters. So now what's looking at this plot, if you have a fireball event, you have alpha and beta cal calculated, you drop this point on this plot. And if you end up anywhere below this red line or curve, you would have a fireball event which will produce meteorites and also produce craters. If your event is in between these two lines, so you would have meteorites survived. You could go to the field, recover meteorites, but energy would not be sufficient to produce a crop. And finally, if something is above this line, then you have fully ablated case, so fully destroyed in the atmosphere event. This explains why Tunguska, even so the mass was so huge, but the mass loss was so intense, that eventually when it reached the ground, there was nothing to be found in, in form of meteorites. And this is where our Anama star fits magically. And most of uh, this uh, kind of uh, present day meteorites which uh, have registered trajectory, they also cluster around this area. And this is where Chelyabinsk fits. This is unpublished blood. Yes, it's, it's a very nice, it's almost like etalon around one one. Yes. This is an example of a decent fireball network. What I really like about this fireball network, apart from which they have a really, really great team working there, it's very easy. You go, it's a dessert. So, you know, if you calculate something and you go to the right place, you really recover. And so far, all meteorites that uh, we have recovered, they are identified here and they fit. So it's, uh, it's very nice and easy because we have a lot of registrations, good skies, a lot of uh, cameras. And now a lot of meteorites too. 
So the alpha beta can be used to determine uh, consequences of an impact for model by one. They could be also used as an input for light curve modeling, which I didn't touch here. But if you do it, then you could also say about rotational rate. So it could be used to identify meteorites, craters, error bars, other, other peculiarities. Mm -hmm. And our success cases now include meteorite recoveries in Anama, Ozerki, also Odalen in Sweden was quite rightfully predicted. This, this is very easy to, to apply to big data. And we have uh, many pieces of software, so if somebody is interested, we are sharing it freely. I could uh, give you something or guide you to the right place to get it. Something was published in this book with uh, Joseph Rigorelligas, Assessment and Mitigation of Asteroid Impact Hazards, which you could get. And something, of course, in form of publications, which I included just some. But yes, here it is. <laughs> I think it's probably all. I also wanted to thank you to Esko Lutinon because I'm so grateful for meeting him. He was amateur, but uh, I mean, he's really, he's a genius. And we did so much uh, nice discussions and papers together. So he he's really, really, really great man. And he was behind the Finnish Fireball Network for many years. And with, um, Ideas, what we share together is just out of this world, really. <laughs> yes, I'm grateful. Also, now I'm continuing his work about uh, comet industrials, and this is also amazing. So it's, sometimes it's nice to, to work with people outside academia, I don't know, I wouldn't even call it, because they have very unique vision and ideas, and it can be just, wow. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, for this uh, wonderful talk. It's really impressive what you have shown us. Um, nice explanation of Tunguska. Uh, mm -hmm. That why you can produce meteors or meteorites or cutter. The basis of the alpha. So I would like to ask whether there is any question of the audience. Or maybe the Remote assistance, okay. In the meantime, I can ask you about, uh, can you briefly tell us about uh, micrometroids, why they are important to study, and what you are doing with the University of Malaga in that regard? I think we show different, different uh, degree of melting, and I think, um, so different processes, it would be important uh, to see which produced kind of maybe meteors, which not, if we, what was the interaction with, with, the, with the atmosphere. But I think the main reason why it is so interesting, you, you, you see it's recovered meteorite, you really need kind of a fireball network and you need observations and processing observations and you need manpower to go to the field and cover it. But with micro meteorites, you need to basically imagination in place and then go to the roof and pick up it. And it's very likely that if you are persistent and determined in what you want to find, it's very likely that you can find it. So you could study micrometeorites without having a dedicated network. And you could just have a dedication. And I know uh, Jan Larsen, he was coming for a visit in Helsinki last year. We collaborate, so he gave some samples. Ah, it's amazing. I think his. I think I gave you his book. Yes. Um, I think his work is also really unique. So a lot of people, a lot of science, most scientists, were thinking it's impossible, but he proves it's possible. So micrometeorites is is now I think is a rapidly rising field, and you could recover many of them. Any of you could go and recover many of them, and we are just learning what what can be done with them. And it's amazing. You look, it's really like dust, it's dark. And until you look under a microscope, what we did also with uh, Rosa in Raman and with, uh, now with Javier Lacerna, he might have very unique instrumentation in the lab. And when you look, and it's completely, it's just another word. It's almost like a planet. And you know, it's uh, we are also different. It, 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 it's unbelievable. So for me, I think it's, it, it's very interesting. Too. It's very interesting. Too. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, you, you mean spectra like of micrometeorite which is already collected? You mean in, 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 in the lab or in, in, in... Oh, from trajectors? I think we're too small. The micrometeorites are just too small, they're like, um, yes, that's micro size. But um, I don't know, we are now, we were discussing last week with Emilio, who is a, a booted engineer, some possibilities of uh, interstellar detection, because I, I'm thinking, so this could be a possibility, maybe something. But, but of course, there are, there, are, there are some options. On it. I think we should always think big and uh, like beyond beyond what's already achieved of whatever crazy ideas because this is way forward. <laughs> Especially now when technology and software and the hardware so rapidly developing. We should keep keep mind. Mm -hmm. Hey, what is Maria, what uh, uh, has been a hot topic in the last weeks? Uh, ah, yes. <laughs> how do you distinguish uh, whether a fireball is produced by, by a natural object or something else? Velocity is different. So is usually, it possible? It's, no, no. Velocity, velocity. Velocity, velocity is usually different. So usually if you have a space debris or some reentry, it's usually low low velocity. So in, in our case is... Um, usually from 11 to 72 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see Eloy is here listening online. Uh, so with Eloy, we just published another paper on hyperbolic. We, we have registered one hyperbolic in Finland. It was 73.5 or something kilometers per second confirmed. But we have very nice explanation that maybe it's over cloud perturbation. So we don't say it's interstellar yet. But with uh, uh, space, uh, with reentry, you have the other end. So it's usually lower than 11 kilometers per second. But when, for example, with last week event, we have to look more into this, but I think what can be happening if you have a grazing event, like low uh, like low slope, so it's grazing, it's a grazer so-called. What can likely to occur, but it actually starts outside the field of view of a camera. And if it starts outside the field of, view of a camera, you may think it's low. But if you know, maybe it's already slowed down. So it has to be carefully looked. I didn't have so time yet. And we didn't get original uh, data records yet from University of Malaga. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. So there are a few things you could distinguish. But also the first video which I was showing with iron, we guessed it's iron. Even so, it's so unlikely that it's iron. It's usually like one out of 50 is iron. It, this is key. this is true for meteorites in museum, and this is now also true for meteorites uh, meteorite falls registered because we have fifty and we have one iron. Uh, but uh, with this one, we still guessed it's iron because it went so low threat, and we, <laughs> we were thinking it's iron already when populating because it was just so low eleven point twenty eight. Yes, so I mean, when you go through many events, you you get some sense of some feeling. What is it? Some feeling, but usually very slow. Yes, and there are uh, separate uh, web pages I should share with you. Um, special web pages where they do alarm about space junk coming. Because there is a special networks for space debris monitoring, and usually they do alarm about the junk. So you could also compare versus with uh, alerts. <laughs> with this uh, subject also, mm -hmm. where in, in the plot alpha beta, where are the space junk? Or it can be anywhere. I mean, um, I, I'll explain it like this. So look at alpha, look at alpha as mass, but when you have to correct by the slope and by the shape. Mm -hmm. So alpha is kind of compo composed of mass 
and size, shape and slow, slow trajectory scheme. This is what's in, in alpha. Uh, so the bigger the object is, the smaller the alpha is. So the, the more you move here, the more likely you are you end up here. But then look at beta as material. Okay, it's, it has more components, but one of them is material. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less, you see, where ice bodies, bodies composed of ice will be over here. So this will be big, big bodies composed of ice. This will be small bodies. Like I have a separate uh, graph not published also yet, but maybe we do. When we analyze with radar, because the radar is so sensitive, we get super tiny dust particles. And when we get meteor showers, really, which are hardly, hardly uh, sensible with any other method. And we got really clusters here. It's, it's so nice to see. Like we get um, clusters in, in this upper corner. Area somewhere, maybe I just did this. So we get these clusters from each other. So I think it's very nice and it makes sense to me because it, it has super small mass, so it has big alpha, and it also has big big beta because it's so fragile and goes around. So I so with the junk will be it's if it's made of iron somewhere here, but then usually when we when, 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 oh, so I, I made it oh, oh. You, usually usually the mass is so but it actually manages to, to to fully ablate in the atmosphere. Right. But I was doing, for example, Stardust CRC reentry capsule. I was just recently reviewing papers, so I was looking for this my old uh, abstract or what. Yes, and it, it gave good result. I think the capsule was maybe 48 kilos. And using this method, I get uh, 45 kilos or something, which so I think is very good. This region here, right? Well, the capsule was with um, the capsule was with bit uh, probably is, is zero. <laughs> I don't know. So, okay. so yeah, if bit is zero, it's um, I don't know. I mean, if bit is zero, it means no mass loss. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit off. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. If there's any other question, please let us Maria again. Thanks, Maria.